you don't mind, I'm just going to take one moment. Oh, it's, a, it's in a hand up. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Navigate. Um, we are very, very lucky this week to have joining with us uh, Simon Hayes, veteran vet. I thought that was a good one. <laughs> um, with It does, doesn't it? With a number of practices. And um, I suppose, again, because I'm in the blessed position of being able to select the topics that I think are relevant and, and topical, um, a lot of people have been speaking recently about their lockdown pets. And I don't just mean one or two people, but I think um, certainly within our community, we've had many people telling us about their lockdown, uh, their new family members, pet family members during lockdown. And um, certainly for a lot of families speaking about how important these new family members are to their children um, and how in some senses have become a little bit um, of a coping mechanism or a help through you know, repeated lockdown experiences. Um, I thought it's a really good topic to look into, but also there's a very um, Jewish take on pets and animals, not simply because we're taught in the Torah how to look after and how to protect animals and what our relationships and our responsibilities towards animal animals should look like. But also there are lots of midot, there are lots of character traits, there are lots of really good learning and teaching opportunities that arise um, simply by having pets as part of the family. Um, and Rabbi Dr. Landau also um, is going to speak a little bit about that. Um, and I'd also like to open the floor towards the end for um, if anyone has any questions for either for our vet Simon or for our therapist slash Rabbi uh, Landau. And um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hand over to you, Simon. Lovely. Thank you, Shoshana. Um, I thought, I thought it would be uh, useful just to sort of introduce the subject a little bit, you know, in that I, I, I've been a vet for nearly 30 years and it's no surprise to me that um, owning, owning pets and owning animals is beneficial, you know, both to individuals and to families. And I think to sometimes whole communities as well, you know, as a, as a vet, I get involved in uh, lots of things that, 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 that show you how communities can be built around pet ownership. So, you know, you might find that, that people will walk their dog together, or you might find that, you know, that, that, that they train their dog to be a, a pet dog at a hospital and a group of people then sit and have a cup of coffee and talk together and these type of things. And you do, you do find in training classes that people who train their puppies together then stay friends together, a bit like MCT classes with children, you know. And I, I, I found the vet practice that I worked in for most of my career is also a community where, you know, people sit within the waiting room and they start to get to know both the staff and the other, other clients and customers. And it, it, animals seem to have a way of bringing people together. And, you know, I, I remember many points in my life where people have said to me, you know, you're a vet, why not a doctor? You know, it's not really a job for a Jewish boy. And actually, when I started out on my career, I think it was because, be, because I wanted to work with animals, I wanted to get the scientific side of it. But as I've gone through more and more time, I've realized it really is about people, you know. In essence, the animals are the conduit to helping people as a vet. And I think, you know, an animals and pets are a conduit to lo lots and lots of things within family life. So I, I, I think moving on from that, as Shoshana correctly says, you know, there are a huge number of lockdown pets. So um, I'm... I'm certain that the figures have changed since I last looked at them, but the, the reported number of uh, lockdown puppies and kittens is 3 million. So there were already 8 million dogs and 7.5 million cats in the UK, and another 3 million have been added to the pet population during the 18 months of lockdown. Now, that's obviously made vets very busy during lockdown, um, during a very difficult time to, 
offer the services that we offer, but it also probably has meant that lots of people have uh, got, got a new pet in their life without maybe having the same thought processes and time to process why they're getting that pet. You know, it, it's 100% correct, Shana, that, you know, they offer a, a, a solace during what has been a very difficult time. Um, but I think I, I, I see my job as a vet a little bit in almost putting people off having pets. Um, and I think the Landau's can probably attest to that, you know, but, um, you know, I, I, want, I want responsible pet ownership. I want people who know that it's the right thing for them. And we're undoubtedly going to see some problems with these animals during the future. I already, just on Monday, I saw an eight-month-old Cocker Spaniel puppy that's uh, suffering real emotional disorders as a result of not socialising properly. Um, I, thought, I thought, you know, let, let's have a think about what, what most people take into consideration when they're thinking about getting a pet and you know ultimately it doesn't matter whether we're really talking about you know a, a dog a cat a hamster a parrot a rabbit you know whatever it might be the same thought processes really need to be gone through and i think what most people do is they think about the basic needs of that animal so you know it's going to need housing it's going to need feeding it's going to need possibly exercising it's going to need um you know, toileting when it needs to and these type of things. But what people forget about is um, the, the commitment and the time that it takes to look after an animal. Um, you know, if, if you regular, regularly go on holiday, who's going to look after the animal when you go on holiday? Who, who's going to care for it when you can't? You know, if you like going out in the evenings and, you know, the dog's going to be on its own all the time. So, you know, it, if it's... Uh, if, if it's raining, are you going to take the dog for a walk, you know, and and the concept of, of getting a puppy or kitten is fantastic, but they don't come ready made, right? Dogs, especially, are the way I tend to put it is bags of learned behaviour, right? So, you know, they, they, they don't know how to toilet train, they don't know how to eat from a bowl, they don't know how to how to be part of the family. They have to be taught all of these things over time. And, you know, it, it, it really is a commitment. Um, I, th I think as well on the converse of that, people often think of the benefits as just really basic, you know, in that you'll have another sentient being in the home, you know, that doesn't talk back that's often a benefit um you know but but you know we think about the common sense things that maybe they'll teach families and children that they'll teach about responsibility and fun and you know love hopefully and 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 even if if we get it right some empathy but i think it's it's much more than that you know i've seen some incredible stories during the during my time and i think you know, dogs, uh, dogs especially, but some some children really bond with cats as well if they're the right type of cat, and they're guinea pigs and rabbits and all sorts of things. And I think cognitively and social and physical development is, I think, proven to be enhanced by children that that grow up with pets. And you know, ju just some studies I sort of pulled out. So. Um, I, th I think reading especially is, is pushed forward by owning a pet, which you'd think, well, how on earth does that happen? But in, in some studies that have been looked at, I mean, to be fair, most of these are in America because that's where these things are a bit more advanced. But, you know, if you think about it, how many times have you seen in a, a film or on, you know, a TV or, or even your own children that they'll curl up in a corner with a book and their pet and they'll read to their pet, Right whereas they would never read to you or to themselves. But they, they almost do it in that sort of, I'm the teacher, you're the pupil type manner, but it's a judgment-free zone, you know, where, you, where, where they, they develop their skills in, in, in reading. And I think um, a, a, a big study that I've sort of held on to over the years when I talk to parents who are considering getting a dog or a cat is that, um, Children, children were asked in this study what advice they would give to their peers who were having trouble socially, having trouble making friends. 
and uh, a, a majority of them said to get a pet. So they didn't say get the best trainers or you know the best toy or what have you. It was it was to get a pet. And when they dug into that, they found that it was because it gave commonality of, of something to talk about. So it, 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 it's a bit go like going back to that community feeling that I was talking about is that if you've got a cat and someone else has got a dog, you can automatically find something to connect with and something to talk about. And it, and it breaks down barriers with, with children who are struggling. Um, I think, uh, that there's a lot of a lot talked about nurturing behavior right and again i'm sure rabbi landau knows a lot more about this than i do but in modern society it's it's not the norm for within families for siblings to nurture each other right so everyone's out for themselves really and it's parental teaching that teaches nurturing so you know in 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 other societies where parents are forced into situations where they're not around and schooling maybe isn't what it is in the Western world, the older sibling will care and nurture the younger sibling, you know, which we all hope happens in our families, but it's not natural behavior. But if there's a pet around, it teaches that nurturing behavior if you if if it works properly. So so that you know you're 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 probably teaching skills for future life love and family just simply by owning an animal and, and caring for it um so i think i think those are some of the emotional sides of it there's obviously health benefits as well so you know lots of people are clean freaks and uh, worry about having pet hair and slobber and saliva and all the all the horrible things that go along with owning a pet but actually, in in again, some pretty big studies that are done, children, young children who grow up with pets are half as likely to have allergies. Um, now, whether whether that's because of the theory that we live too clean a life and sterilizing bottles and you know every, everything's cleaned within an inch of its life, so there's no there's no uh, exposure to things that cause allergies. I, I think there's definitely something in that, but you know, I, I, I believe strongly that, that animal, animals will uh, reduce those allergies. I've seen it a lot during my career. And, and on top of that, you've got exercise. You know, you own a dog, you go for family walks. You know, when do families ever go for walks together? Right. I know how much of a struggle it was for us, but, you know, you, you bring a dog into that or a puppy and all of a sudden everyone wants to go for a walk. Their friends want to come around and go for a walk with them. And, you know, it's it's a, a, a brand new situation. And that, again, is, is part of the family bonding as well, is that you do things together as a family because the animal is the central part of that. So um, I think I think I know this is a, a family based group um, but I think there are some adult benefits to owning pets as well so there's some very very well documented studies about reductions in blood pressure and cholesterol um, and also in cortisol levels so stroking a cat will really bring down your, your cortisol levels I know you know my my uh, opening up a little bit I've had times in my life with some anxiety and if you're trying to sleep at night and I mean, this might be some people's idea of a nightmare, but for me, having a cat purring on my chest, the vibrational energy of a cat purring really calmed me. And, you know, stroking, you, you can just feel yourself calming down. Um, and I, I was thinking about um, mental health as well, obviously, because we're on with Rabbi Landau and, um, you know, thinking about episodes that I've seen in, in my career where, you know, both children and adults with mental health issues have told me how the dog has, has really saved them, you know, um, or, or the cat for that matter. But I was, I was thinking of something people might have, have seen. I don't know if anyone has watched Ricky Gervais's Afterlife, the series. Um, I, I'm not a massive Ricky Gervais fan, but he is wonderful in it. it and, you know, it's about his recovery from his wife dying and uh, he is essentially suicidal and one of the only things that keeps him going is his dog 
you know he 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 wakes up every morning to feed his dog and it's the only thing that really gets him out of bed and you know i've certainly seen and heard real life stories like that as well um so you know i i i can only exalt the benefits of of owning pets you know i think it it's uh, it's a wonderful experience i think there's lots to consider you know what what type of pet is right for your family? Are you in a position as a family to offer a home to a, to another living being? Um, you know, do you live in a house? Do you live in a flat? Do you have to go up ten flights of stairs? Have you got an elevator? You know, it, it, do you have time? I think time is the most important thing. You know, we can all we can all make time in our lives, but you know, there are more. It's really sad, but there are more animals put to sleep in the United Kingdom for behavioural reasons than there are for illnesses, which is, you know, incredibly sad. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think most of those occur with, with people who take on animals that just haven't done their research properly. They haven't got themselves ready and in a, in a position where, where it's the right time in their lives to do so. But, um, you know, I, I've... Uh, I've got got another story that you know might might it's it's not really to the families but it's a story that I really love. So um, I was uh, asked by a, a rabbi who is also uh, dealing with some mental health issues to help with a, a case he was working on. So he was working with um, the the Haredi community in Stamford Hill, and there was a eighteen year old boy who was really badly attacked by a dog. Um, and he ended up in hospital and had stitches and you know all sorts of things and he became agoraphobic he became terrified to leave the house and to come out and so the rabbi involved asked me because we've known each other a long time he knew I was a vet and he asked me if we could if I could think of anything we could do to introduce this guy to a dog in a safe situation because he was doing the rabbi will know more than me on this doing a type of therapy where he wanted to confront him with the thing that was causing his fear and um, we decided it would be useful if he came to the surgery at a time when I had a dog under sedation so that he could see that it wasn't the dog in control it was us in control and that we were able to to manage that situation and you know on the day that he was coming in it was interesting the the only dog that was available to be sedated was a massive french mastiff a doge de bordeaux i don't know if you've seen turner and hooch but it's the big orange slobbery creature that looks like the hound of the baskervilles and i was like oh, man, this really isn't going to go well and uh, this guy walks into the surgery so the practice is in winchmore hill it's not it's quite a greek area not a particularly jewish area and so first in is the rabbi with his beard and his black velvet kippah, followed by an 18 year old uh, Haredi guy in full garb with his payot and his uh, strimal and his stockings and what have you. And uh, didn't speak a word of English, just Yiddish. And uh, we took him through and the, the dog was under sedation when he came in and he just started laughing. You know, he was. He, he, he found it hilarious that this dog's tongue had lolled out and that, you know, we could lift its head up and open its mouth and, you know, do what we wanted with it. And uh, he, he eventually touched the dog and stroked the dog. And uh, according to the rabbi who I was dealing with, the, the guy is much better. So I don't think he likes dogs now, but he uh, certainly can go out on the street and he can, uh, you know, do, do the things he needs to do so you know not not a not a particularly positive story about owning dogs but uh, a, a story that's really stuck with me so um i i can prattle on for ages shoshana but i think that's probably enough from me for the time being and i'm happy to take any questions as time goes on thank you very much simon um may i start with a question sure so um, you mentioned about about um, pets being good for anxiety, particularly if someone's unable to sleep. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, is there a certain age at which, I mean, obviously we're not gonna put pets into a cot with babies, but is there an age at which it is um, safe for cats to be in a child's bed or dogs for that matter? Yeah, I, think, I, think, 
there isn't a there isn't a set age. Um, I think that that you know that there there is probably no time where it's ever completely safe to leave a dog and a child alone. Um, and you know, I I say I say that hesitantly, you know, because I know lots of dogs that are completely bomb proof with children, including my own, who I would leave with any age of, of child. But you know, I think the responsible thing is is probably to manage that situation. So, you know, cat, cats after you know once once you end up in a situation where the child isn't going to pull bits that it shouldn't be pulling you know their tails and ears and you know prodding and poking then you know i think that's perfectly secure you know and you'll you'll know with the cat that you own because every cat is different you know so so some cats love to curl up with people some hate it right but you'll know that from a, from an early age so by the time that cat's six months old you'll know whether it's a curl up on your lap and or curl up when you sleep cat or whether it's a out roaming trying to kill mice at, at night cat and uh you know you can't predict that really but with, with dogs i think you know that that for, for me it's a good way to get them to sleep and then to bring the dog away you know whether that be in a bed on the floor or whether it be you know, in another room, but I, I wouldn't leave a, a dog and a child alone all night. It's just, you know, my opinion, I've seen too many horror stories. Thank you very much for that. Um, are you happy to take questions now as or, or at the end? Should we, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Okay, we can. Hi, can I ask a question? So um, I have a dog and um, whenever we go for walks, she always hides under the bed or hides to the goes to the back door or hides under the table um, when we're going to go for a walk. But she loves it when we're on walks. So right. what's that? What's Does everyone get really excited? Mm, well, I say walkies widow or, you know. Right. There's so, maybe, there was quite maybe during lockdown, maybe a lot of shouting, trying to get the children to go for walks and they're saying, I don't want to go. And maybe that yeah. could be something. How, how old's your dog? Two. Two. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about, about them being learned behaviour, right? So essentially something has caused her to be, or, or have some anxiety about the getting out of the house. And so her response is to go and hide because she doesn't want to be shouted at, even though I'm sure you haven't shouted at her. But she doesn't want that. She wants to, you know, disappear from that situation, take herself away. But that's nothing to do with the walk, right? So mm. some, some people uh, say to me things like, um, you know, why does my dog jump up when I greet it in the morning, right? And so that's because... When they're young puppies, we tend to put the dog maybe in the kitchen in a, a restricted area. And then we come down in the morning and, and the kids come down or whatever, and everyone's really excited. And the puppy's natural response is to put their feet on you, right? Even though they're really cool, maybe up on your shins or on your knees. And everyone's like, oh, good morning. How are you doing? You had a great night. Well done. So we're thinking exactly that. Good morning. Isn't this great? She slept through the night. The dog's thinking, if I put my feet up there, they really like it. <laughs> so that, that's how these behaviours become ingrained. And what, whatever has happened has caused that behaviour to become ingrained. So the thing to do is unwind it, right? So to, to not do the same routine as you would normally do before going for a walk but to probably to, um, with treats, get her to the point of the front door, right? Put her lead on and then just go, right? So not to make the fact of that going for the walk because in the same way that some dogs develop anxieties about being left on their own, mm -hmm. being left on their own, they've, they've learned the, the key things that you do before you go out. So a dog with a separation anxiety will often say to people, go to the front door, pick up your keys, and then go straight back in, 
them just sit down again, right? So you decondition them to the things that they've conditioned themselves to be, to have anxiety with. Not right. similar to children, let's face it, you know, but <laughs> they never grow up from about a two or three year old child. <laughs> That's great. This is so Pavlovian. On, on that wonderfully um, psychological note, uh, Rabbi Landa, would you like to take it from there? Thank you, Robertson Landau, for that kind introduction. Um, it's really fun being on separate screens with my wife. That's amazing. Um, so what Shoshana's asked me to do for tonight is to share some psychological thinking around pet ownership, which Simon's already touched on uh, meaningfully, so I'm not going to uh, tread on that too much tonight, but also some perspectives from a, from a, from a Jewish uh, approach. I'm going to try and give a balanced, like both per, pros and cons from, from both perspectives, um, as well as some sort of um, overarching philosophical positioning that Judaism gives about animals and animal rights and pets. So I hope that's going to be helpful. And then once again, we'll have open up for questions. And those questions can once again be for Simon or for myself. Um, so let, let's start with the psychological. And as Simon said, there are, ah, Simon said. So as Simon said, you, you, you've never had that before in your life, right, Simon? So there are, <laughs> there are um, and ma ma multiple psychological sort of um, correlates, associations between pet ownership and um, positive psychological outcomes. A lot of the stuff that Simon said has been done with dogs, simply because I think, you know, dogs do provide um, probably that range of different activities that pets that, that can that can be offered. So dogs will offer the social uh, interaction. Uh, dogs will offer the petting, the calming. So in terms of social interaction, dogs are going to be able to counteract some issues of loneliness. They will give you those opportunities, as Simon said, also about um, you have a ready means, a social in. You know, nowadays people have to wonder how do you get a social in with a group. Um, you have all these online sort of uh, methodologies of meeting people, the easiest way to meet a person. I think there are even films about it, you know, two people are walking a dog and they, they knock into each other or rather the dogs sniff each other's butts and then the owners say hello to each other. So, you know, that's, that's the way of meeting people and then striking up conversations and overcoming certain social anxieties. Um, dogs have that petting, dogs have that calming and there's all sorts of different hormones, both, um, so sort of biological things, body-based hormones and also neurotransmitters that seem to be stimulated through that petting. And I don't think that that's just, this, that's probably not just a, a one-way process that the dog calms the human. I think there is an attunement between the human and the dog. And humans have owned animals for literally thousands and thousands of years, all the way back, you're thinking of the uh, the 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 pyramids in Egypt, whereby pharaohs were buried with their livestock, not just their livestock, but also their cats and their dogs, their pets. They were buried with their pets. Now, that wasn't the best end for some of those pets, but it shows you the importance of pets, even in ancient life. So humans and animals have lived along the, alongside each other for a very, very long time. And that's because maybe evolutionarily, we have um, created this symbiotic relationship. So it's, I don't think it's just, you know, we get something from the pets. I think the pets get something from us as well, more than just shelter and food. I think there's, there's, there's some evidence to show that there is a sort of a psychological or physiological reward for the animals as well uh, by being in tune with their owners. So that's, that's really interesting about the de-stressing. And I know that there's a, there's a, a member of ours in the community who has a therapy dog. So that therapy dog has been um, trained and uh, he came they brought him around they was going for a walk and they knocked on our door and it was amazing i think uh you know shoshana's here on the call shoshana was just like melted into this dog it was amazing so dexter. um there's His name was dexter. dexter that's right you i don't remember dexter. everyone's names but um, i remember dexter <laughs> <laughs> he had a profound impact on you shoshana so you know so that's that's very special to be able to have that calming and there are hospitals that will use pets in place of analgesia, in place of pain, um, pain medication. So there are people, there are studies that show that for, for patients who are undergoing painful treatment, who need, um, patients that might need a, 
uh, a procedure that requires them to be very still and very calm, like an MRI. An MRI scanner can be very scary because it's, it's an enclosed space, and particularly for a young person to be put into an MRI scanner and have to stay very still, that can be very, very disconcerting. But having like a dog present, like sort of that image of Simon with a cat on his chest or whatever it would be, having a pet present, that reduces their, their need to wiggle and to squiggle. That also reduces the need, the need for painkillers. There's all sorts of interesting things that like, I haven't done much of this in terms of my doctoral um, training or practically here in, in the UK. But if you, as you see, you Google some of this stuff and you, there's, there are reams and reams of associations. I think there's a little bit less understanding exactly what the, um, how it works to create an attunement between human and say canine such that then these physiological changes occur. We see the physiological changes occurring. We do see that. We don't really necessarily understand all the, the whys, right? So, so why is it that a dog will do that? Is it about changing the way that I'm breathing? Is it about um, the, 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 the sort of the stroking? Is it a mindfulness that the, that the presence of the canine might bring around there? I think the jury might be a little bit out on that, but it's certainly it's an interesting association nonetheless and a, and a really powerful one as sort of evidenced by Shoshana. Whilst I'm saying that, I'm also thinking of Simon's sort of warning there, which is that, you know, to get a therapy dog to, is, takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of training that dog to learn. The dog has to learn how, you know, it might have certain uh, dispositions of certain breeds might be better at doing that. And there might be certain, you know, dispositional traits there. But, you know, just even think of a seeing eye dog, how much training and effort is put in to give that dog the ability to follow the cues, to, to know how to lead someone. So we might have that fantasy that we'll buy puppy and puppy will instantly give us all those health benefits, all those psychological benefits. But that's actually, that's a, that's a load of work. That's a, that's a huge amount of work to get pet from raw material into, into that sort of, that productive member of the family who is going to be supportive rather than the other option, which would be we don't give it that time. And then pet becomes a wild to a permanently wild two year old, right. That is, that is, you know, that is just all over the place wreaking havoc. And then it becomes a bit more tricky and certain breeds. Like, again, I, I'm staring now straight into Simon's territory, but you know, my brother got, is it a Bengal cat? So he got, you know, these are it's like a semi feral cat basically because he thinks the cat he, the cat is absolutely beautiful it's an it's a stunning stunning um cat but the, the thing is crazy right it, it, and it never calmed down it never got beyond um being a, a semi-feral thing so um now the cat basically lives in the loft and it doesn't really get to interact very much with the rest of the house because it's too dangerous for the two-year-old it's it's and it's it's too dangerous for the cat itself. Like the cat, if the cat falls down, it's already done this once, it broke its hip and needs a hip replacement. That was quite an expensive operation as far as I'm aware, Simon, for a cat to have a hip replacement. So, you know, like these things are, of course, you always get insurance, but these things are worth bearing in mind actually to get. But then, you know, like anything, if you want to have a, a child that is going to be a decent, moral, lovely human being, one will have to put in the effort to do that. It's you know, no different to having a wonderful, decent, you know, pet, but obviously just slightly different. Okay, so that, that was one thing. No, but Simon. Sorry, jump in there on the Bengal note. You, you could put as much time as you like into a Bengal cat, but you bought the wrong pet. Right, because it's not, because it's feral, it is. Uh, what, what they are is they're, they're domestic cats crossed with the Asiatic leopard cat. And it depends on the, the F, that you get so there you can't buy an f1 because essentially that's a wild animal um, most of them that we see now are f4s and f5s people buy them they don't let them outside because they don't want them to be stolen or damaged but they are not they don't want to be pets so we see a lot of stress disease in these animals you know that they, they get a lot of bladder problems and a lot of health issues as a result of being stressed because they're, they're just the wrong animal for people to own yeah okay so do speak to someone who's in the know about the right breed if you want to be purchasing a pet um something that i found really interesting in some of the research that i was looking into before this talk is um one of the areas that i'm quite stuck into in my hospital role is the interaction between mental health and diabetes 
So, you know, young people with type 1 diabetes, often it's a really tricky time that they might get that diagnosis and first experience those symptoms. At quite a young age, it's a massive, it's a massive knock to any sort of life trajectory, at least in terms of how we consider what what a normal life would look like. You know, you and I, we can go for a run or go for a bike ride, we can go out for friends, we can have a drink. We don't have to think about, are my sugars high? Are my sugars low? Do I have to bring a high post stop with me? Am I injecting insulin? Am I checking my blood with a finger prick? There's a whole range of different things that without maintaining blood within sugars within a, a very narrow band, so then uh, it's, it's really dangerous. And so I, I see the hard end of that when people are abusing their diabetes and either intentionally running their sugars very high or very low or both and, and then having sort of the health the health problems associated with that and my, my father's also a type 1 diabetic so this thing which is a personal resonance for me so I found this really interesting that uh, if you give a cohort of type 1 diabetic teenagers tropical fish to look after and you have a, a control group so the, tr- the, the, the group looking after tropical fish have better control of their diabetes compared to the control group. And these are just a randomly assigned selection of teenagers. What, what, what's going on there? So I've had tropical fish in the past. I actually had ridiculously complicated tropical fish. I had Tanganyikan cichlids, which are from Lake Tanganyika in Africa, which are a rock. I'm getting a bit um, passionate about this. They're like a, they're like a rock dwelling um, fish species and they're very intelligent and they have quite have interesting. Yeah, yeah. I know I need to stop. I know I need to stop. Okay, the point, they're beautiful. They're beautiful fish. Um, and um, you need to be really careful about the pH of the water, the temperature of the water. You need to be careful about the interactions, how many fish you've got. You need to be careful about the type of food, when you're feeding them, the lights in the in the tank. All these different sort of control processes need to be there, and it's a responsible thing. You're holding responsibility for keeping something within certain parameters. So that is a transferable skill from looking after a tropical fish tank into looking after one's diabetes. And I think that that idea of transferable skills is really important when it comes to, or could be an important part of the benefits of having a pet, which is that um, that if a child is encouraged to take responsibility to look after another thing, as Simon said. So um, that's also, that's a really, really important life um, skill. because And this will lead into some of the Jewish approaches to pets as well, which is that we're not always so good nowadays, I think, about teaching children responsibilities. We're quite good at teaching them about rights. You know, we, we have things like human rights, animal rights, all these different things, rights for this, rights for that. But we're not always good about, and that basically the, the idea of rights is what I can get from something, what is due to me. Whereas the idea of responsibilities is what I owe to others. And that's really the way that Judaism looks at pets. And I'll talk about that in a second. But in terms of just the basic function of looking after having responsibility for another pet, for another item, for something else that your parents have conferred into you, that responsibility, and you've taken that up and you demonstrate that responsibility, that's a great way to to feel ennobled, to feel responsible, to feel mature, to feel like you can carry something, to feel like you are have efficacy, you have agency, you have power, you have meaningful power in this world, and that that it's, it's used well. So I think that those are all really important life lessons. The, the counter to that would be, let's not let that go wrong, right? Because I, when we were kids, my parents bought us a rabbit and they said, you're going to look after it. And we did not look after the rabbit, right? So ev- the parents looked after the rabbit, which was a really good lesson for how to abrogate responsibility and then someone else would pick up for you. So that was a lesson in being coddled rather than a lesson in responsibility. So I think, you know, there's, there's probably a bit of a tricky one. It's just, a, it's just a balance there. But that also, I think, brings us on a little bit. Go on, Simon jump in there rabbits are not children's pets i thought you were going to say that children's pets and they have to be kept in pairs as well so there's a lot of work being done on rabbits over the years and they're now the third most popular pet in the uk but they are not children's pets and simon you're going to explain that's because temperamentally you know they're just not really very they're, they're very very complex animals so their their physiology is much more complex than dogs and cats the way that they eat the way that they behave is is very different um they require a lot of attention um if you if you buy a rabbit and leave it in a hutch it will de- deteriorate very quickly um you know they're, they're bonded animals that they have to live or they they will get very lonely if they don't live in a bonded pair um as a minimum Um, It used to be that if you got a rabbit, you got a guinea pig, but they just don't like each other. It would be like getting 
you know, put, putting two children from different sides of the world together. So, you know, um, rabbits from Australia, uh, guinea pigs are from Peru. So they, they don't even speak the same language. Um, but they, they also say that, that they're prey animals. We forget this. So, you know, a child comes along and tries to pick it up and they're naturally going to scrabble and bite and try and get away. So, you know, they require a lot of time and energy. And I think, I mean, personally, when I was looking at pets as a uh, slightly an older person, when it was like parents can't say no, right? So then, then I started looking at the most exotic and strange pets that I could possibly find. So, you know, at one point we had a chameleon, we had a boa constrictor, that was Shoshana's. Um, these were all really fun things to have conceptually, but actually as pets, not amazing, you know? I mean, the chameleon was really interesting, like the, the, the tail and the fingers and the, the tongue shooting out to get the locust from your hand, that's all fun. But as for a kid, that's just, you know, that, that's a very delicate animal that is very highly sensitive animal, probably shouldn't be kept as pets at all really. Um, so maybe, maybe at some point- with More pet crickets than you do pet lizards. What was that, Simon? You end up with more pet crickets than you do pet lizards. Because <laughs> they die, right? Yeah, shame. Um, maybe, Simon, before I jump into the Jewish stuff, this is a good time for you to give some tips about what are good family pets or pets for children to have some of these benefits from and where some of the dangers could be, in, like choice about breeds or size, you know, that, that might be a bit more tricky. I think that you know, what I would say is stick to the basics, right? A bit like you're saying that, you know, what, what are great pets? Dogs and cats are great pets, right? They, they, they generally want to be pets. They generally need the love and attention of a, of a house um, or of a family. I think that the, the type of dog that you get, often that's down to, do you want to take on a rescue? which, you know, is a really admirable thing to do, but you're often taking on someone else's problems. Do you want to take on a puppy? Also a lovely thing to do, but hard work, you know. So a, a, a lot of the time people say, well, what's the perfect, you know, perfect dog for, for us to get, right? And they'll say, oh, we don't want a really small dog and we don't want a really big dog. Right. Well, that rules out Chihuahuas and Great Danes. But in between, there's an awful lot of breeds and, and you know, crossbreeds and all sorts of things that, that, you know, you can look at. And part of it really is preference, personal preference. What type of look do you like? Do you like a squashed faced dog, which I would disagree with, but, you know, they're really popular. Do you want a hairy dog, a non hairy dog, a, you know, soft hair, wire hair, all, all sorts of different things to consider and actually you know when when you're looking at the natural behaviors of dogs you know most dogs will have the same but with certain things uh, I suppose more or, or more visible in different types of breeds so you know retrievers are called retrievers because they like to retrieve right but they're gun dogs there's a group of gun dogs and gun dogs are generally they 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 love being out and about they love to swim they love exercise but they're very responsive they're reasonably easy to train um, because otherwise they wouldn't be very good gun dogs um, then you go the other way and you go to terriers and terriers are designed originally to you know go down maybe rabbit holes and or, or hunt, hunt other types of, of small animals and you know they're, they're not very responsive because they're used to just being let go and then come back when they feel like it so you know they're a bit more difficult but you know I had bought a terrier for years and she was a really great dog so you know you, you, the, the, there's there's I think nothing you can't end up with if you put the work in with a dog but they will have certain traits which are, are more or less seen based on the type of dog that they are so so i guess it's about understanding what you're getting more than necessarily deciding okay and whilst we're talking about dogs then let's jump in i think to the jewish approach to animals so i think dogs have an interesting rep within judaism both positive and possibly negative 
So first of all, dogs, I think, first feature in the Torah in the Exodus story that the dogs did not bark on the night of the Exodus, despite the fact that the Jews were leaving Egypt. Right. We said that in ancient Egypt, they had their pets while well, they had dogs. And despite the fact that the Jews were leaving Egypt and that barking could have um, could have. Um, alerted the Egyptian authorities to the fact that the exodus was occurring, that the dogs were were silent. And actually, the reward that the Torah gives to the dogs for their silence is that if there's an avela, if there's an animal that has not been killed by shechita, by uh, the appropriate means to make it kosher, so what do we do with that animal? La kella tashlichon oso, throw it to a dog, give the dog the meat. So, so the dog has always been sort of the object of thanks because of that initial loyalty, right? Man's best friend, Jew's best friend, that loyalty to the Jews for not, um, for not barking that night that the Jews were leaving Egypt. That's, so that's an interesting way that we position dogs there. But then again, I think post-war, Dogs, post-Second World War, dogs have become slightly a bit more taboo, certainly within um, some communities, to have or a Jew to have a dog. That's not something that, that, that was done, at least for many years, because um, people set dogs on Jews, essentially. And actually, I think that one of the most harrowing Holocaust films I've ever seen was about a Jewish man who was a, an actor in... Berlin, I think, before the war, and a real sort of like mimic and, and comic. And he became the dog of an SS officer running in a camp. He, 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 he had to take on the role of a dog. And then he, the, the, the film takes, a, takes place in an asylum where he is taking the canine out of his personality. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stunning film, but um, with amazing actors in it, but it's a very, very harrowing film. It's set in Israel in, a, in an asylum in the desert. Um, how do Jews look at animals and our responsibility to animals? So I started talking about this before, which is that we're not so keen on the idea of animal rights. It's not that animals have this inalienable right that they have to be that, that, that they do, that like we have they demand treatment. But actually, the onus is not put on the animals' rights, but on a human's responsibilities. That humans, by being people that are created in the image of God, have to be kind, have to be caring, have to be loving to all things, including animals. And that forms Jewish law in many areas. So, for example, if I'm sitting down for my meal and I have a dog, so I'm not allowed to eat, I have to feed the dog first. If I see, if I'm going down the road and, I'm, and I see an animal struggling, I have to stop what I'm doing and support the animal with its load. Um, we recognize the responsibility that a human has to behave in a humane way, to um, resonate with the attributes of kindness, of care and compassion. And that is something that is a beautiful thing to practice in all times, even with an animal. So... If we want to talk about the religious value of, say, an animal, it's to practice the responsibilities that I would have, not just then to animals, but also to all creations, human and non-human, that I have, I resonate with kindness, I resonate with goodness to others. So I think, you know, the, 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 that, that, that sense of animals and, and um, how that could feature within a home that we, before we sit down, we make sure that others have food to eat, that will then spread forth into social responsibility as well. So when I'm thinking, has my dog had something to eat? I might think if people down the road have, to have the homeless people uh, at the shelter, have, have they had enough to eat? Maybe then it's, I should stop eating right now or at least think about that and take them some food as well. So we get to practice responsibility to God's creations um, with our pets. And I think that's a beautiful opportunity. Finally, there's some interesting sort of halakhic issues and then we're open to questions more broadly is that there's some interesting halakhic things that go on with pets for example on shabbat that pets and are um, are actually muksa that, that, that a living animal is set aside from shabbat so there are, there are things about stroking an animal's fluffy coat if that's going to put out its hair can i stroke its coat can i lift an animal up so there are all sorts of interesting questions that happen with pets on shabbat those and none of those things are insurmountable as i mentioned the jews have been living alongside animals we humans have been living alongside animals for for, for thousands of years, but it is something to be aware of when having an, a pet, that there are sort of interesting halachic um, things that pop up. Shabbat is one, so the mooks are status of animals. For your own animal, it's easier than for someone else's animal. So pet owners can look after their own animals because they're responsible for them in a different way to, say, patting someone else's or picking up someone else's animal. Also on Pesach, that's a real area that can be a bit tricky, that you know, we're not allowed to have chametz in our homes. And many pet foods have chametz in them. 
So you have to buy kosher, you'd have to buy kosher Pesach um, pet food, or you know, for that week, your dog is going to be dining on the finest steak mints, or your fish will be dining on the finest fresh blood worm if that's appropriate for their diet, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. So or your your rats will be eating the finest lettuce um, and kosher the pace of chocolate. Rats, rats can have a little bit of chocolate, right, Simon? Um, it's a nice treat for them. So that was my other set of pet when I was a kid was was rats, and I thought they were they were great fun. So anyway, so so those are interesting halachic things that come up and um, discuss with your local Orthodox rabbi. I look at looking at the time, and I think Shoshana would like us to open to the floor to questions. So over, over to everybody, some, some questions now. Two very quick points on what, what you've been saying, Rabbi. So rats are fantastic pets, incredibly intelligent. They've just got really horrible tails. But, you know, other than that, they're fantastic pets. Um, and you were talking about Egyptian cats and, you know, being buried with their cats. Some research has showed really that our domestic cats now are really closely related to those cats from Egypt. That's where they all stem from. Um, and that's why, I mean, I can, we're amongst friends, that's why cat wee smells so bad because they are desert dwelling animals and they learn how to concentrate their urine with their kidneys. So they make very strong urine as a result of that, because all desert dwelling animals find a way to conserve water and cats do it by making really smelly wee. <laughs> wow, <laughs> the stuff you learn. Um, Leah. Hi, sorry. Um, so I don't know whether anyone's watched the Netflix program Shitzel, I think, it, or how's it pronounced? Shitzel, Shitzel, something like that. Yeah. Shitzel. <laughs> um, I remember in one episode he brought a dog home and his father said you can't have that mutt here basically and like what would everybody think and it and and uh, it made me think oh is it not allowed in very religious communities to have a dog or what was that connection why was that so I, as far as I'm aware I think that that comes from the fact that the dogs were set on Jews in the war so yeah. we have a, a more recent aversion to dogs but Simon might have looked into this a bit further as well two other things and I, I have no idea if these are urban myth or real or not you can probably help me with it so one is the Talmud story about um when Rabbi Akiva saw the vision of the foxes running through the destroyed temple so foxes related to dogs and so they got a bad rap at that point and the second, and I, I can't remember where this comes from, but I, I was told that dogs are a symbol of infertility in people. But I can't, I can't pinpoint where that came from. So by, you know, by having a dog, it's a sign of, of infertility. That's interesting. I'm also noticing that in some sort of rabbinic and other literature, dogs are associated with... Um, like immoral practices so there might be some sort of stigma around around the concept of a dog um yeah interestingly in, in people not in the Haredi community but more and more of people I know who are who are classed as modern orthodox and from are getting dogs and cats you know it's, it's no longer I don't think seen in the same way yeah I think it's changed and there seems to be some stigma Go on. Most of that's happening through the benefits it brings to families. Right. I think there seems to be some stigma around um, uh, that keeping dogs, keeping dogs was maybe a, a, a more widely non-Jewish practice, say, throughout Europe. And then it, it, that to, to copy the activity of, of the non-Jews was then also frowned upon. But, um, but going back biblically all the way back, then they are, they are praised. So I think it's a bit of a mixed bag on that one. Um, something that I had wanted to ask and something that came up very briefly last week was um, the the notion of teaching children to to deal with grief. Death of a pet. I thought maybe you could touch very briefly on that. I, I was avoiding it because it's quite an um, upsetting topic, but it's really important. And, you know, I think um, often with children, when a when a when a pet dies, I get asked a lot by their owners how they're going to tell their children, you know, because often as well, 
you know, we're, we're making a decision to end that animal's life. It's not, you know, obviously not because we want to, but because we're ending suffering. And, you know, it's a question, do we bring the child with to say goodbye? Do we tell them what's happened? It depends, you know, on the age, but my advice always is to be as honest as you can be, you know, in that if, if you, if you tell the child that the dog's gone to live on a farm in Devon, they will inevitably find out. <laughs> you know? um, and so, so, so honesty, I think is really important. And I think it, it teaches lessons before, please God, people suffer the, the reality of losing a grandparent or, you know, someone else in their family. And, you know, not to say that it lessens the blow, but it, it's, it teaches that grief is acceptable because lo losing a pet, you know, doesn't matter whether you're a child or an adult, there is a grieving process that you go through. And it's the same stages of grief as you go through when you lose a, a person. Now, it may not be as amplified for, for everyone. It may be, you know, easier to, to deal with for some people. But I've, I've seen, you know, probably my hardest days as a vet have been, you know, when that pet is all that that person has. So often, you know, someone will come in and the dog was their husband's dog and he's passed away and you know it's the link back to that memory and that life and you know on and ending that life with that person that you know I've, I've stayed in touch with a lot of people as a result of not wanting them to be lonely so you, you know we talked earlier about pets uh, uh, you know lessening loneliness both in adults and in children but you know we have to look at the other end of it that that you know there, there is a, a natural lifespan of all pets, you know, and that that whilst we sit, you know, in our rational brains and think about, oh, well, that will be really good for my children to teach them about death. It can be devastating to some children. And, you know, when you think about the timings that we get pets, you know, let, let's be honest, say, say you're buying a, a dog, right? An average dog will live 15 years, we hope, right? You buy that puppy when your child's two or three, that's their A-levels when that dog dies, right? So I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying there's more to think about than, you know, j just uh, just the, the here and now, right? And, um, you know, look, looking, looking back, I think, especially with, with cats, right so cats are now living regularly 20 years you know and uh often often when we're ending life there we talk i talk with the owners about all the things they've gone through whilst that cat's been by their side right so their children have grown up they've you know maybe remarried or got married or you know whatever may have happened in those 20 years 20 years in a life is incredibly long time, you know, and, uh, you know, that animal has been the solid, you know, point of reference throughout all of that. So, you know, but, but I, I think probably the most important lesson is, is that, that there is grief and that it's okay to have grief and that it's, it's normal to feel the things that you're feeling. Thank you. Um, anything to add? I just wonder if there are any other questions, just because we're getting onto time. Otherwise, I will. I can add something. But stunned into silence. <laughs> I think we've. I, I just add then. Well, yeah, I just add to that then. Um, before jumping, that um, when whenever I do a piece of work with someone, I'm starting with the end in mind, so that. That this has that the yeah, F is starting something together, but there will also be an ending of something together. And unless you buy an African grey parrot, of course, which lives for about 70 years, so then maybe then there will be an end to uh, Simon's going to say, Don't buy an African grey parrot, but you have to speak to Yesco about that. But, um, <laughs> um, which is her, so, so that's her fantasy at the moment. But if you start with the end in mind, then you can talk about you can talk about these edge or barrier or boundary experiences 
maybe from a little bit earlier on, so you're preparing them for that. And I think that those aren't bad conversations to have. I'm a little bit of an existential person by disposition, but also by, by my roles, I think that it's no bad thing to be able to have a conversation with young people. Even, you know, we have conversations with, with Yiska, even from a young age around, around uh, death. I mean, she had a bit of a death fascination as a child, so she said, but as a young child, so she was definitely going through Freudian stages. Um, she was, but th- I think that did allow her to process a little bit better her great grandmother's passing last year, because this wasn't something that she didn't understand. There was language and iconography and concepts around it. So she has concepts of heaven. She has concepts of being with Hashem. She has concepts of um she also has concepts of like resurrection of the dead so that might not work so well for the pets but the point is is that she there are there are there are there are mental anchors that i think stack up for her so that she's prepared for this and i i think that that that's no bad thing to prepare a child to the adversities of life not the traumas of life but when you can make a trauma into an adversity you've changed something from something which breaks you to something which can make you a little bit um so that would be my thought there. Thank you very much for joining us, Simon, and also Samuel, also Rabbi Landau. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this week. Um, please do send me an email if you are collecting CRP points. And just a reminder for next week, we um, have joining us a couple of representatives from Genetics, the organization within the Jewish community that deals with um, Jewish genetic diseases, the importance of detection, prevention, awareness, and support. And um, they will also be open to questions. So please either submit questions anonymously beforehand or on the evening if, if you're happy to. Thank you again, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. And see you next week. Bye.